Dadron Zipper decommits from Pitt. What's the update on Kenny Minchie? And could Pitt maybe flip a Virginia Tech commit? We're going to talk with John Garcia Jr. about all of that today, coming up on this episode of Locked on Pitt. You are Locked on Pitt, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Panthers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome into the Locked on Pit podcast, folks. As always, I'm your host, Nick Farabaugh. Today's episode of Locked on Pit brought to you by Underdog. Sign up at underdogfancy.com with the promo code Locked On and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. And as we always do when we talk recruiting here on the Locked on Pit podcast, I want to welcome in John Garcia Jr. John, been on the show many times, always great. Welcome on, man. Good to be back on with you, Nick. Uh, hope all is well. Yeah, it's good to have you back on. Pitt four and three right now in the season has gone the way that the defending ACC champs are looking at it. And on the heels of that, uh, they get a decommit from Dadron Zipper. The most sure. recent commit to only had been committed for about a month. Um, obviously, after the Heike Williams ordeal, he took the official visit to Utah. Um, we're hearing Utah, UCF, maybe in this. There's a lot of different moving variables. What kind of happened here? What precipitated this? And and, and was he ever truly fully committed or was Utah keeping <laughs> in kind of the, the catalyst for that? Look, I mean, b- before Zipper committed, uh, we were in contact with him and said, hey, look, I know Utah has this official visit. W- what's the deal? Are you going to take it no matter what? And, and there was a, a brief period, Nick, where he was uncertain. Hey, you know, I'm committing on the 24th. The, the Utah trip is supposed to be uh, the, the following week or whatever it was, or two weeks later. And as we got closer to the commitment, Utah kind of didn't slow down. Uh, so, so that looked like it was going to happen basically no matter what from the moment that he committed to the Pitt Panthers. Uh, so obviously whenever there's a visit scheduled to another school, just like we used to talk about with Hakeem Williams, it kind of lessens, uh, you know, the the impact of that commitment. And just like Hakeem Williams, who visited Miami, I think the week after committing to Florida State, that the door is kind of wide open. So the verbal commitment is is soft at best, and then you go from there. Uh, so obviously, he takes the trip to Utah. It goes really, really well, and they become more of of a factor in his recruitment. So I think that really sparked the the reset um South Carolina, South Florida, UCF all involved to a degree there as well. Um so I think for from his perspective this was more of just hey, let me just make sure. Let me back off and and make sure this is this is where I want to be. Uh so almost a, a late reset in this recruitment. But again, shouldn't be a huge surprise with that Utah visit looming right right around the time that he verbally committed uh, to Pitt. So just, uh, again, par for the course. It's recruiting in in this modern age where it is a spot. It is not the final spot. Yeah, it is par for the course. Now, this is Pitt's second decommitment of the process, which is pretty good for all standards. They had one back in June to uh, Shelton Lewis decommitting, who ends up now Clemson um, as a a Clemson commit. Um, But, Overall, pretty good job of sticking on this class thus far from Pat Narduzzi and staff. You eliminate Zipperer from the equation, and uh, you kind of assume, I mean, it, it can happen. I, I wouldn't assume he's going to recommit the pit. It's happened sure. before, but it's rare. Um, how do you look at this wide receiver class now for Pitt? They have three guys coming in. Um, it's still looking like a pretty good group with Kenny Johnson, Zion Fowler, Lamar Seymour, just no danger in Zipperer. And maybe they try to find a fourth guy to fit in there. But this does affect that wide receiving class just a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Because we talked about Zipper as kind of a blend of of some of these other types, particularly Fowler and Johnson. I I do think that the three that are still on board are very solid. And I actually had a a buddy of mine watch Seymour last week. And he said, man, I don't know how this kid is leaving the state of Florida. I mean, he was so surprised that Miami, Florida, Florida State weren't going to double down on, on this kid because of, of how dominant uh, he has been as a senior at, at Miami Central High School, one of the best top five high schools in the country this year with, with some big upsets to the resume, including IMG Academy. He was just like, man, I can't believe Pitt is, is grabbing this kid. So I think that that flip uh, looks really strong at, at this point. He's probably the, the highest floor of the three wide receivers, but you have a nice blend with the other two in terms of athleticism, route running polish and upside. So I do think that it's still a very strong group. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I do think there is room for another should a, a late uh, emerger rise uh, in the senior class, uh, or, or maybe hey, maybe this Virginia Tech commitment who who plays both ways, Dante Lovett, maybe he's the type that you say, hey, I know they want you at DB, maybe we want you at receiver. I, I don't know if that's the case to date, uh, but you know he could bring some some juice on that side of the ball as well. But I, I do think there's potentially room from one more addition, and we all know they're not going to slow down on Ike Williams in the meantime. Yeah, for sure. There's no doubt about that. I have two questions about the Daydream Zipper stuff still. One, what do you think about Daydream Zipper? Is, he's, is, is it still possibly Pitt's in this, I guess, is what I would ask about the Daydream Zipper stuff. Look, uh, recommitments are rare, um, but when you're looking so far away from home, and you've already made that call, it's not out of the realm of possibility. This kid has been quiet at times during his recruitment. He's suffered an injury and kind of gone dark uh, throughout a, a big part of the process. There's a lot of intrigue and mystery around him to, to a large degree. So, uh, again, we talk about skill position players from Florida. They're on their own path, right, in their own lane, if you will. And these things sometimes happen. Um, so we have seen stranger things happen in recruiting. But, yeah, typically this late in the process, six, seven weeks before the early signing period kicks off, you would be somewhat surprised if he ended up back at Pitt. But, look, if he doesn't take any more visits and and he's kind of status quo with the options he has, Pitt is still very much you know one of his, his favorite schools in the conversation. So I think it could depend on Utah. It could depend on how much – the Utes are pressing for him, how much room they may have in the class to go across the country to get another skill position player, which is something they often do. So the ball could be in Utah's court, but look, that's recruiting, right? Sometimes it doesn't work out and, and there's not enough space and all of a sudden he's, he's reconsidering and it comes down to Pitt, South Carolina, UCF and USF. I mean, it could very well happen that way, uh, but there's no doubt that Utah it appears to be the program in the best position at this point, especially coming off of that official visit. And then one more question I have is, okay, you, you look at this pit recruiting class right now, and there are some athletes in here that maybe identify on the defensive side of the ball, but are putting up some pretty good offensive numbers or, or an athlete. And one of those guys that sticks out is Jesse Anderson. Um, he, he's a guy that does a lot on the offensive side of the ball. Pitt recruit him as a DB, but what do you think about him potentially being a switch candidate? We usually see guys come in, maybe presented in one way, and then the spring comes and all of a sudden they're they're in a different position. Is, is he a guy <laughs> that maybe has upside at receiver on a power five level, just as he does clearly at defensive back? Look, when you've got length and ball skills, you, you've got the foundation. And as you said, there's some experience there with, with Jesse on his own right. Look, it is – it's proven, right? When you talk about that two-way ability – oftentimes the offensive side of that coin is easier to ease into, especially when you're talking about that transition from high school to uh, college football. So, you know, DB's tough, right? Technical coverages. It's, it's really a, 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 a feel more than it meant than anything else. I think offensively, especially at wide receiver where we see so many freshmen make an impact really across the country. It's a little bit more of, Hey, this is what you already know. You're just doing it at a higher level. So I think in that regard, the transition could be easier on that side of the ball if all things were even. Um, and that's why you recruit two-way guys. I think a lot of these recruits that, that we've talked about at Pitt overall have some type of secondary sport or secondary spot uh, experience on the football field. And those are always advantageous for the school because, yeah, position changes happen. I mean, some of the, the best players in college football came up playing another position, right? How many receivers do we hear about playing quarterback in high school? How many great uh, linebackers played running back at the high school level? So, uh, same thing for receiver DB. So it is something with a ton of precedent, and if the numbers break that way, it wouldn't be the most surprising thing in, in, in this class uh, for Pitt. You know, they've got a bevy of, of skill position talent in the secondary and receiver all, already on board. Running back's not that heavy. So you would expect if there is to be a switch, it could come uh, from one of those position groups. Yeah, we'll see if it could potentially happen. But Pitt might be trying to flip somebody right now that could maybe help that or, or go in another uh, group. But I want to first get to you guys – all caught up about underdog fantasy because folks there's an emphasis on how easy underdog fantasy is it's the easiest place to spice up the college football season how you want it while you're watching pit play folks listen all you have to do is go to the underdog website and just put some pick em choices in 
for Pitt or whoever you may want, right? If, if I want to go against UNC Pitt right now, Israel abandoned Canada's over under 84 and a half. Are you taking that over? I probably am for Izzy. Um, if you want to bet that and then put in conjunction with that, Drake May is going to torch this Pitt secondary and throw for over 253 and a half. Feel free to do it. You can stack it. You can go anywhere from two to five parlays. If you want to, folks, it's easy to play. It's available in over 30 states. It doesn't just have to be your team. You can decide, though, if they're going to finish higher or lower on their number. It's one of the easiest fantasy to play games that is out there right now. Folks, sign up with the promo code Locked On. That's one word. Locked On and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Deposit $100, get $100 free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code locked on. Again, that's one word locked on. Get in on the college football pick 'em action today. All right, John, let's talk about Dante Lovett. This is an interesting offer from Pitt, was offered by Taekwon Underwood, um, which is also another wrinkle in this, obviously. Yep. Um, but the Hokies seem to view him as a corner. Now he's listed as an athlete. He's a guy in Maryland, the math Catholic, um, that, that Pitt has, has gone into and recruited every now and then. But do you think Pitt is viewing him right now as a corner, a receiver? What what about Dante Lovett? What's the storybook on Dante Lovett? This is a football player, Nick. Uh, you mentioned the math Catholic. Great competition, that Catholic league in Washington, D.C. That area is, is one of the best leagues in high school football and his senior season has been unbelievable. A true, not only two phase guy, three phase guy. I mean, you you'll see some kick return action maybe before you see his work at wide receiver or in the secondary. And that's gotta be exciting from a coaching staff perspective because you have so much open book uh, with this kid at six, 190 pounds. So he's big, physical, versatile, obviously extremely athletic and instinctive. He's got some wheels on top of it, but man, with this kid, you can make the case for either side of the football from, from the offensive perspective at wide receiver, big, long strider, um, very explosive at the catch point. Um, he caught a 50 yard post over two guys uh, recently uh, for DeMatha, a, a guy who naturally courts the football incredibly well. Probably a little bit more raw in the wide receiver department, uh, but certainly has that foundation athletically and, and from a frame perspective to make that move full time. And, and wherever he focuses his energy in college at one position, I do think you're going to see a big jump from a technical perspective. And then defensively, instinctive corner, willing to play physical. We mentioned the ball skills at wide receiver. That shows up on defense uh, as well. Uh, again, with that great size, he plays corner, probably profiled a little bit more as a safety at the next level. So there's there's really a lot to work with here from a height, weight, athleticism, and skill set standpoint for Love It to the point where, yeah, depending on scheme and system, you can make the argument he belongs on one side of the ball versus the other. Uh, but, but bottom line, this is a football player. This is a guy who makes plays on defense. He creates turnovers on offense. He creates chunk plays, and on special teams, he returns kicks for touchdowns. So he's, he's somebody you can use on either side of the ball. But for me – the combination of Zipper decommitting, Taekwon Underwood extending this scholarship offer and trying to provide a counter to what Virginia Tech uh, has provided, I think is all smart for Pitt in this case, right? Uh, we'll see if he takes a visit and all of those things. But if you're going to present him as a wide receiver and go on Pitt's long history with that, that position and that side of the ball, I do think it offers something outside the box enough to potentially get him off of that local commitment. Um, he's been committed there for a while, Virginia Tech. Uh, he's been on campus recently, as recently as this month. So it's pretty solid. That's fairly local, right? You're talking about uh, Blacksburg, Virginia to, to uh, Hyattsville, Maryland, not incredibly far of a trek for him to go. So I think if you're going to pull him away from it, you got to go a little bit more outside the box. So if, if VT thinks you're a DB, Pitt can offer you as a wide receiver and, and bring something totally different to the table. He's starting to pick up other offers as well now because he's having this great 2022 season. So he's going to have something to think about regardless. No uh, visits of record uh, from an official visit perspective yet under his belt. So there could be some drama with Dante Love. But he's got the, the um, – allotment of visits at his disposal he can take up to five at this point um here before the end of the season so depending on how coveted he is i wonder if he starts to set up some of those trips uh, but he does appear pretty darn solid to, to virginia tech at least at the time of this pit scholarship offer 
Yeah. While we're recording this, Pitt just extended another scholarship to wide receiver Jaden Skeet, who is go. a Boston College commit. It, it's flip season, baby. You, you know, it's look once once we get Halloween closer to Thanksgiving, it, it's flip season. Big visits, rivalry weekend, coaching changes, changes on the recruiting board, and rewarding these senior risers. All of those things factor in to big flips. Uh, really across the sport, we've already started to see them uh, on the the college football recruiting front uh, this year. So it's it's not going to slow down anytime soon, and it looks like Pitt still definitely wants a fourth wide receiver on board in this class. I think that's the biggest storyline to take away from all this. Yeah. And Skeet from Boston. So um, right up there in Boston college territory. So another kind of hometownish kid that they're going to try and pull away. Tycon Underwood, not afraid to go and fight those battles um, very, very clearly um, as, as we sit here right now. But I want to flip over now to a, a guy we've talked about forever. I mean, ever since he committed right after the NFL draft, Kenny Minchie has been the crown jewel of this pit class. Yep. And listen, when you're four and three and you're not meeting expectations, and your offense looks like it does right now with Pitt, you're going to have worry about the four star quarterback that has had Notre Dame and Ohio state chirping in his ear before. Now, Kenny Minchie seems has seemed very solid. You, you've said on the show before he hasn't really entertained Notre Dame. Notre Dame's not having a good season anyways right now. Um, but is there an update on Kenny Minshew? How firm is this pit commitment right now for Kenny Minshew, just knowing that there is some paranoia potentially out there after Pitt's rough start? Look, understandable paranoia from the fan base, right? It's been um, just a different year, right? New offense, new expectations, new players, and it's – it's been up and down, to say the least. So naturally, there's always going to be a bit of a worry with the class headliner from a recruiting perspective. But it's never that simple. It's never that much of a one-to-one ratio of on-field record versus perception in recruiting, especially for quarterbacks and especially for kids who have kind of been there and done that. You know, Kenny Minchie ended the process early for a reason and, and really hasn't entertained much else since that point. Um, he's visited uh, earlier this month. So I, I do think... There's a lot to, to, to stand on from this pit perspective. And I think with quarterback, it's always hyper unique because on one end, yeah, things aren't going great with the season. Keen Slovis wasn't the grad transfer we thought he was going to be, whatever it may be. But on the other side of it, it's like, hey, now there's potentially an opportunity for him to come in and play earlier, maybe earlier than than we all thought. So on, on every – you know, panicking fan bases and there's worry, but on the other side of that, it's a sell. And it's something Notre Dame and AM and Miami and a lot of these underachieving programs, Auburn, are gonna do to these recruits and say, hey, things aren't going great. You can see it, we can see it, it's obvious, but why don't you come in and help us immediately as opposed to develop and help us more down the line? Uh so if if that's something that could potentially help with a Kenny Minchie, but again. You know, he's he's had every opportunity to take these other visits, right? He's been injured for about a month. He's missed four or five high school games uh, with a shoulder injury. Not supposed to be too serious, by the way, which is good news. Every opportunity to go see Notre Dame, go see Ohio State, go see some of these other schools that have touched base with him. But at this point, one, a lot of those schools have addressed their quarterback needs, uh, which is important uh, for, for Pitt in this, in this angle. And two – a lot of the schools that haven't addressed that quarterback need are in a similar boat to Pitt in terms of it's not going too great this year, right? The teams that don't have a quarterback verbally committed, Wisconsin fired their coach. Um, Auburn may be about to fire their coach. Texas A&M, a lot of people want them to fire their coach. So it's it's not it's not a situation where there's so many opportunities available. Ohio State has since figured out it's quarterback. Notre Dame has a class of 2024 quarterback they feel very good about. And there's some reclassification rumors there as we see a lot of 2024s start to jump in to 2023. So a lot of the schools that were the immediate threats to Kenny Minchie and Pitt have appeared to not move on, but readjust their plan, Ohio State and landing a quarterback and Notre Dame, maybe with another one on the way as well. So if it's those schools, you worry a little bit, but if it's outside of that box, you feel pretty good about where Pitt uh, stands with with Kenny Minchie. Um, if it was, you know, if it was the Tennessee Volunteers in state with the season they're having and that kind of offense, you start to worry a little bit. But they they figured out their quarterback board a long time ago, so uh, I don't see a lot of quarterback movement on the horizon from a decommitment perspective. Not only with, from Pitt, 
But I think across college football, a lot of the the hot seat programs don't necessarily have that big time quarterback locked in. So I think I think Kenny Minchie is most likely to end up at Pitt. That silence is golden in his recruitment based on the type of kid that he is. Yeah, that's that's good news for all Pitt fans. I know that Kenny Minchie is kind of the ray of hope, if you will. Right. And I think you bring up an interesting point. The fact that Slovis hasn't been very good this year. It does kind of ring the bell that maybe Minchie starts as a true freshman next year. And, and you've talked about you you think he can do that if in the right circumstances. I also wanted to ask you about this. I haven't really asked you about this in regards to Kenny Minchie. Frank Signetti Jr. is the guy that was kind of the lead dog in recruiting on Kenny Minchie. We know his NFL experience. We, we know his pro-style offense. Kenny Minchie looks like a pro-style type of quarterback. Yeah. How important do you think the NFL experience of Frank Sinead, the pro-style offense that Pitt runs that maybe doesn't fit Slovis as well, how do you see, first of all, Minchie fit into that, and, and how important do you think Signetti actually is to like interlocking that commitment with Minchie and Signetti as, as kind of a, a duo, a, a, an OC quarterback kind of pairing its recruitment? That's a great point, Nick. Um, I think we assume all these quarterbacks coming from high school are throwing it 50 times a game, but that's never been the case for for, for Kenny Minchie. I'm looking at some stats here compared to some of his other Elite 11 colleagues. Uh, he only played in, uh, I believe, two or three games uh, before that shoulder injury. 64 passing attempts in those those two or three games. So now you're talking about you know, maybe 20 attempts a game, um, and and you're asked to be efficient within that, right? So within it, 73% completion percentage, 11 to 1 TD interception ratio. So kind of exactly what you want from a pro-style quarterback, right? Efficient yet still productive and still able to put the ball up in the end zone. So Kenny Minchie's already come through that system as, as a high schooler where – He's not throwing it 50 times a game and having to do all these crazy things. It's more conventional. It's more efficient and and, and comfortable in his regard. Uh, so I do think that's something that is important uh, to consider. This isn't a kid who thought he was going to play in an offense that threw it 50 times a game and demanded the quarterback run a ton and all these things. Uh, he understood the adjustment that was going to be made, especially considering what, when he committed, right? Like you said, after spring ball, after having been up there a couple of times with this current coaching staff so as much as the 2021 group allure you know created an allure and 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 helped to to perk his ears up it's this staff and this system that kind of locked him in so i think in that regard it makes it makes a lot of sense uh for minchie to stay solid and and again you couple the fit with the fact of you know th this kid's demeanor is always the same i just think he's got this mature angle to potentially be one of these guys that plays early again, we we fall into the trap of if he's a freshman, you know, a freshman impact type of guy, it's got to be this crazy stat, you know, freshman All American type season. It doesn't always have to be that. And Pitt has adjusted its approach offensively to favor those types of, of quarterbacks where it's not all on you, it's not all on your right arm, it's on all of us the offensive line, the running game, the defense, etc. Hadn't always worked out for Pitt, but that plan is something that Kenny Minchie fits into that much more, especially if he's asked to do so as, as early as next year. Yeah, we'll see what ends up happening. It sounds like Kenny Minchie is probably going to come to Pittsburgh um, next year. John, is always, great stuff. Tell them where they can find your stuff, read your stuff, follow you, all of that great stuff. Well, yeah, some class rankings are coming out because it's about to be a new month uh, over at SI.com. So check us out, SI.com slash college. And we're talking college bond recruiting all the time on Twitter at John Garcia underscore JR. Folks, make sure to check out John's stuff. He does great work. And as always, as we end it here, hail to Pitt.